pulling this piece of paper out, and I feel like someone that I think Ken's going to talk about later, and I won't mention him, and he probably won't either, but he will talk about it as I do this. Uh, Lynn Kaufman mentioned that, um, that Fred and I had a vision about Moonfish, and I just want to say a lot of other people had the vision and had the, had the uh, hope in Moonfish that made this possible, starting first of all with Sandy Rumagoo. She's the first person I talked to about it, and she went for it immediately. And then, of course, Bob Costi and Lynn Coffin has been incredible. And uh, we could not have done it without Wendy, our secretary. I'll tell you down there, it was incredible. So there are a lot of people with vision. Another person with vision, of course, is Ken Kesey. And I met Ken. Uh, when I took his uh, creative writing class at the University of Oregon two years ago. And what he wanted to do at that time was to write a group novel. And he convinced the university it was a good idea. A lot of other people didn't think it was. I think it's been a tremendous e experience and a tremendous experiment. And it worked. Uh, the novel was sold to Viking and will come out in January. And since then, because of what I learned from Ken, I've taught uh, group screenplay writing at the community college in Newport, and it's worked wonderfully. And there are a lot of people that think group writing is the wave of the future, and I think that's part of Ken's vision, and I'm very glad to have been a part of that. And that's why I'm very happy that Ken agreed to come here tonight and also saw Moonfish as something that was something that was needed and also a wonderful thing to have promoted here on the coast. And I thank you for being here and for believing in it. Um, Last of all, what I want to say is that when I thought, when I talked to Ken, when I first mentioned it to him about Moonfish, and he said that he thought it was a good idea, he said that he would be very happy to be here. And that's what started it. And then we were lucky to have Ken Babs, who taught the fiction writing class, and Charles Deemer from Portland, who came down to teach the playwriting class. And those two classes, I think, have been tremendously successful from what the students have said this week. And I think that is part of the luck of Moonfish, too, along with a lot of hard work from everybody involved. It's been said many times about Ken that he is a magician. And of course, as a magician, and I've written in an article that came out in Newport, and I'm sure you read, a lot of you read that, that Ken is a wizard, too. And one of the tricks he does is to write. And he wrote sometimes a great notion, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. But he does a lot of other things too. And I think mainly Ken Kesey is a Renaissance man, one of the truly Renaissance men. Working with him in the class and working with him for a year at the University of Oregon, it was really clear as we watched him that he is not only a writer, but he's an artist. We watched him make the cover for the, um, we watched and helped make the cover for our novel. He's a musician, a wonderful musician. He also works on the farm. He's, he uh, has peacocks, and he has cows, and he has hay that he gets in. He does lots of things, and I could go on and on and on with the type of person he is. But I'm not going to do it. <laughs> he won't let me. <laughs> and because he said that I will, no, I won't. <laughs> I'll just introduce you to Ken and let him speak for himself. Ken. Yeah, I think Moonfish is a real good idea. I think that it's kind of been percolating here in this peculiar little area for many, many years. Anybody who's followed the progress of Beulah's knows that this town <laughs> has a sense of drama. Uh, and that's what gave rise to Stratford-on-Avon and, and Wolf Trap. Um, it's a peculiar place. It has been ever since I first saw the Oregon coast. And the people that are here are here because they want to be exactly at this place. This place isn't on the way to anywhere. <laughs> uh, if you want to go to Newport, you go to Corvallis and across. If you go to Florence, you go down there. This place is the last little drizzling place left on the coast where people are here just because they want to be here. 
The people that are passing through, let them go. Um, I think that it can grow and use its unique location. And this thing that the ocean does to you, I have a cabin down the coast where I try to work. That sounded like Elizabeth. <laughs> uh, and I find that I can't sit out there and look out at the ocean and get any work done. It just hammers the hell out of me. Pretty soon I have to go somewhere else. I was over there and my friend Larry McMurtry called me while I was over there and he said, how are you doing? I said, terrible. I've been over here for three days. I haven't been able to do anything. He says, don't you know that nature is not good for writers? <laughs> he says, you've got to go in a closet if you're going to write. He says, you can't stand out there and look at the sunset and really write about it. He says, there's the sunset. So the quality of just the sun coming across that ocean like a great golden bowling ball to the back of your brain has an effect and it always will have, that whatever you guys put on here, it's going to be some kind of success, whatever direction that it takes. And I think you can have a lot of fun with it, and maybe even make some money. <laughs> the, what I want to talk about tonight has to do with who I want to speak to. I think of artists as wizards. And you speak differently when you're speaking to people who want to be wizards than when you're speaking to people who want to sit out and be part of the audience. I, I love to be in the audience. I love to be fooled by a good magician. I just reread uh, Sun Also Rises, and I thought, what a magician. The way he pulls off those tricks so simply, and you don't know he's pocketing the thing when he does it, and then it shows up over here, he's good. I love to be on stage doing it. I hate the other part, the backstage part, that other thing that happens over there that is sort of in the limbo between the two. Let me be up here or out there. Never mind this other stuff. And I want to speak to the people out there that are wanting to be up here. I want to talk to the people that want to be writers and artists and wizards and musicians I didn't know I was a great musician, Lynn, that's nice to say. Uh, because you speak to these people differently and you reveal some tricks. And you talk about tricks and how these tricks are accomplished and try to let the people know how to do those things. Because there's plenty of room up here, there really is. Um, all you have to do is quit going over there and hanging out backstage, either be there or the up here. Don't get caught in that midway position. When we conceived this class at the University of Oregon, people mainly thought of it as, let's just try this and see if it works. I knew it was going to work. The energy that can be accumulated and just keeping people together long enough gets incredible. Babs was talking about uh, his writing class and he's just been doing it a week and we were talking about the energy that goes in, not just from his point of view, but from all of the class's point of view. It's hard work and pretty soon, by golly, it will squeeze something out of you. I, I've been working on a book about Alaska for a long, long time and I found that I've ha I'm having a hard time coming up with the main part of the book, but I have one little story inside of it that I'm sure of. This is the pearl of the novel. I'm going to go with that, and I'm building the oyster around the pearl. It's easier than building the oyster and then opening it and putting the pearl in, I've decided. So <laughs> we're going to kind of be talking about how do we build this pearl? Where does it come from in our spirit? and how do we tap that vein? I'm going to read the introduction that is appearing at the beginning of the Viking edition of Caverns, which as Lynn says is coming out about Christmas. Um, it's going to be a big book. It's, I don't think, going to be any great book or any successful book, but the idea is going to take hold. The idea that people can get together 
and do something together and get energy off of each other is what get Linda Ronstead and Emily Lou Harris and, and Dolly Parton together. They get a new energy that you don't get just by making your own record by yourself. And it takes a little bit of turning your ego over to the other person and trusting them with it. And this is kind of what I want to talk about today. How can you trust these people? <laughs> this introduction, I'm going to interrupt the introduction as I go along because it's shortened down quite a bit. It used to be a fairly long thing, but I realize nobody reads an introduction in a book anyway. You go to the book, and then if you like the book, you go back and read the introduction, so <laughs> I've shortened it down quite a bit. When it comes to a place where um, I feel like I want to step out of speaking to the reader, and speak to the potential writer. I'll just do that, and you'll know when I go back to the script. When it's all over, we'll take some questions, uh, but we'll try not to have it lapse on in, because apparently people have been at this a long time, and let's not overdo it. This introduction is called, You Can't Mistake Those Burning Eyes. Before the Reagan administration cut off liberal money to the arts and humanities, I traveled around to a lot of posh little writing teaching gigs. They'd fly you in, you'd get a pile of manuscripts to look over, and a bunch of students. After some seminars and receptions, you'd take your check and fly home. The money was good, the hours short, the limelight sweet. But when I look back and try to figure out what exactly did I teach those people? The only thing that stands out occurred, I think, at a weekend fiction workshop somewhere in Texas. 30 students had been picked by the regents, not on their ability, I gradually found out, but according to how much money their family had donated to the university. <laughs> One of this chosen 30 students was a nervous old lady, blue-haired, about 75, donated a lot of money to the history wing of the library, one of the regents confided before he introduced her. She was famous for her letters to the editor. She was known throughout the county as a philanthropist, activist, amateur anthropologist. But I discerned at once that what she wanted to be known as, above all things, was a writer. You can't mistake those burning eyes. When her turn came, she pity patted primly to the front of the class with a gay bouquet of pink inked pages and began reading a sing-song tale dealing with her youth in an orchard where she was trying to pick peaches and her mature life in a nursing home where she was trying to teach people who, couldn't, who could barely speak the English language something about English literature. Also, her husband and his near rise to the Senate, poor man. Chopped in among all this was a goodly selection of whatever non sequitur oil widow opinion she happened across in the old icebox. The result was schizoid stir fry, kind of like this. <laughs> I listened to her sing song this sort of stuff for 45 minutes. I was amazed, impressed, appalled, touched, embarrassed. <laughs> Most of all, I was pissed. <laughs> Nobody had screened this story at all. Or worse, had screened it but felt that telling the old dame that her story was unseemly gibberish might be fiscally imprudent. <laughs> By the time she'd been reading about half an hour though, she didn't have to be told. She knew. Everyone who has ever read in front of an audience knows. Eek, this is hideous, bloody, awful, terrible, and I'm only halfway through. <laughs> the gleam started going out of those old eyes at about that point, but she sang-songed bravely on. The manuscript began to shiver in her hand like dead weeds. The preppies at the back of the room started sniggering, finally laughing out loud. When she finished and sank back to her seat, there was blood in the water of that Texas classroom. Twenty-nine sharks were ready to show off their literary chops, and our old dowager knew she deserved devouring. <laughs> Luckily, 
I remembered something that Malcolm Cowley taught us at Stanford. Perhaps the most important lesson a writing class, not a writer, but a class, can ever learn. Be gentle, he often admonished us, with each other's efforts. Be kind and considerate with your criticism.